This is WCNY's The Capitol Press Room, and we're going to share an excerpt from our Dispatches from Planet Albany podcast, where we did a deep dive into the election results and what they mean with Berlin Rosen Senior Vice President Loren Amore, who in another life was the brains behind the Senate Democrats' political operation. Does anything stand out to you about the polls, either from New York or nationally with the battleground states, putting aside the anomaly that was that outlier Iowa poll? I think the polls were pretty accurate. They all predicted a very close race. You know, the averages had Trump winning by a narrow margin. And I think a lot of us probably didn't want to believe it, but that's what ended up happening. This was a a good day for pollsters and for the Nates and the other forecasters out there. You know, the models seem to hold up pretty well. And, you know, I think there's a lot of distrust around polling because of things that have happened in previous years, but they've been pretty accurate for a few election cycles in a row now. In my own world, I have to slap down the everyday layman that uh, tells me how bad polls are or that uh, they missed it again this year. You run in, theoretically, a a smarter circle than I do, at least politically. Do you have to counter some false narratives about polls, or do you deal with a more well-versed crowd that understands this nuance? I I think it's a mixed bag, and and, you know, um, any circle that includes me, I question their intelligence. But most people get that when you take thousands and thousands of polls that are put together, or most people that are kind of work in politics, they tend to be pretty accurate on average. And uh, there will certainly be outliers here and there. The people who have gone farthest in this business are folks who have followed the data. And um, just because sometimes the data doesn't tell you what you want to hear, that's not a reason to disregard it. Well, before we turn our attention to New York, I want to think nationally for a moment and rewind back to Tuesday night and when from your command central, you realized that Donald Trump would win the election. Because my experience was that even after nine, ten o'clock, people were still texting me, Democratic leading people, about uh, whether the blue wall would hold. And uh, I had to sort of try not to dampen their enthusiasm. But when did things become clear for you? Yeah, I mean, my um, my wife was much smarter than me. Went to bed around ten thirty, um, so you know, she that that was my that was a good barometer. But I, I will admit, as much as um, as much as you know, the signs were all pointing in uh, in the direction they ended up going. I was trying to you know scroll through the New York Times county level uh, reporting, see how many votes were out in Philadelphia, and try to piece together a path to victory. But um, I should have just. Uh, follow my own advice and follow the data and follow the needle because it would have saved me a few hours of sleep. Yeah, because there clearly Um, were signs, right, that you could make comparisons, say, from the New York suburbs and how, say, Long Island was going for Trump or how some of the suburbs in, in Georgia and North Carolina were voting and what that might portend for Michigan, Wisconsin, et cetera. The first sign that we were certainly in for a a tight race and there wasn't going to be this unexpected Harris blowout that some people were, I think, were getting optimistic about the last few days was um, when Texas came in and was in Texas and Florida came in and were clearly going to be, you know, home runs for Trump. And I think a lot of people were looking at especially Texas as potentially a place where you could see some Democratic gains and maybe even a close race. Um, And when that when it was clear that wasn't happening. I kind of buckled in and said, all right, it's going to come down to the states that everybody knows it's going to come down to. Um, and then, you know, I was I was watching Steve Kornacki on MSNBC, who kept pulling up these suburban districts in Georgia, in Georgia that you mentioned, and also these counties in these rural counties in Georgia, where there was a high percentage of black voters in these rural counties. And, and that was a place where the Harris campaign had expected to make ground. And they were just always a tick or two behind Biden's performance from 2020, which was, you know, enough to, to flip the, the whole thing. So, yeah, and, and, I, and I do think that, well, I'm sure we'll dive into New York. New York was an interesting bellwether, especially the Trump overperformance of his past results in New York City, you know, his continued strong showing on Long Island. I think it it kind of showed that Democrats thought they were picking up some momentum in the past couple of years and pushing back on those trends, but there's something that we're going to have to confront in a very real way. Well, yeah, let's talk about the top of the ticket performance in New York, where Harris appears to have done four or five points worse than Biden did in 2020. Obviously, the presidential race was still a boon to down ballot Democrats compared to the way the top of the ticket was two years ago. But this obviously created less of an uphill battle than Republicans might have 
otherwise expected. Can you put into context what that might mean for down ballot races to see that five or four point drop off at the top of the ticket? Yeah, I, I, look, it's it's not a simple there's not a simple answer here because Harris put in the worst presidential, the worst Democratic performance in a presidential race in New York state in recent memory. Yes, yeah, since 92. Uh, and, and since 92, she, you know, the magic number I always look for from the top of the ticket in New York is 60%. If the Democratic standard bearer gets 60%, I expect that Democrats up and down the ballot will have a very good night. She didn't come anywhere close to that. I think she was in the mid 50s the last time I checked. That's a major problem for Democrats in New York. I don't think New York is on the verge of becoming a, a red state, but it does create some questions about future statewide races, but also down ballot races. I will say, though, that Democrats down ballot had a pretty good night. They, um, they flipped three Republican-held seats in Congress. They held massive majorities in the state Senate and the state assembly, and nothing really changed in, in the legislature. So one dynamic to watch out for is it seems that at least this year, Trump's newfound supporters were distributed kind of inefficiently for down ballot purposes. He picked up a lot of gains in New York City and in other places where there were not competitive state legislative or congressional races happening. And the districts where those competitive races were happening sort of followed their status quo over the last couple of years or even did a little bit better for Democrats than they had in the past. Well, you mentioned that there were the seats that flipped. There were three on election day that went from red to blue and one that went red to blue back in a special election on Long Island earlier this year. That puts Democrats, though, basically exactly where they were four years ago in terms of the size of their delegation. And it's just the the Republican delegation that's shrunk from eight to seven compared to 2021. This backdrop, though, comes against a more concentrated effort to build out the Democratic Party infrastructure, something we've heard ad nauseum from the governor and party chair Jay Jacobs. So given the fact that Democrats are basically where they were four years ago, do we credit the pickups to this infrastructure and the alleged voter contacts it was making? Or is this just a presidential election year boost? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's really an apples to apples comparison. Um, you, you could do orange to oranges, Loren. That's fine. Whatever, whatever fruit, you, whatever fruit you decide to choose. Um, th- we're dealing with first of all, I think different maps than when that makeup you know was last in effect and after the 2020 cycle, right? So New York lost a congressional district. Uh, there's a different. There's just you know the districts look different, but also you have to kind of work from where you started. And this year we started with five seats that Joe Biden won in 2020 held by Republicans and had to claw back a lot of those seats. And so you ended up picking up one in the special election with Tom Suozzi on Long Island, and then you got three other ones in November. And I think that's a success for the Democratic Party in New York. I think you do have to give credit to the coordinated campaign that the governor and, uh, and Leader Jeffries and others invested a lot of time and money into. There were some very close races at the congressional level. And when you're dealing with you know, let's say New York 4 and Long Island, where Laura Gillen is holding on by about a percentage point. When you're dealing with margins that close, you have to look at the campaigns that were being run. And I think the the field efforts and the coordination and the money that got put into these races had to make a difference uh, and, and get, you know, turn it into a night where maybe Democrats would have picked up one or two rather than three. And it would be, we'd be looking at it a little differently. I know there are down ballot Democrats that outperformed Harris at the top of the ticket. One that put it into actual quantifiable terms is State Senator James Scoofus, who sent out an email to supporters. And I think he said that uh, the Democratic top of the ticket lost our district by about 10 percentage points. Our margin of victory will be about 15 percentage points once all the votes are counted. That's a 25 point swing. What is something like that attributed to? And is there a sort of secret sauce that someone like Scoofus was cooking with that we also saw maybe with Pat Ryan, John Mannion, et cetera, where the legislative candidates significantly out- outperformed the top of the ticket for the Democrats? Yeah, I mean, first of all, James Scoofus has been outperforming top of the ticket Democrats in Orange County and, and the Hudson Valley for about a, a decade or more now. So he's, he's very good at doing this. I don't think he's ever run between his career in the state assembly and his career in the state senate, a race that wasn't a hotly contested competitive race with a lot of money being spent on both sides. And he continuously wins 
hyper competitive races, despite representing an area that is trending against Democrats and has been for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So you have to give a lot of credit to the strength of candidate. I do think that Senator Scoopis is an example of a candidate who has built up a unique brand that speaks to the people who live in his district and is both a populist and someone who takes policy stances that are in line with his constituents, even if that means bucking the Democratic Party on certain issues, but is also a partisan who fights like hell to beat Republicans and doesn't make any bones about the fact that he's interested in winning and will be, you know, aggressively advocate for his constituents. So I think that is a model that folks can look to. He's a unique figure in a unique district. So every, I think everyone, anyone who's looking to run in a competitive seat has to kind of look at the data, think about their connections to that district, understand the people that they're trying to represent, uh, because it's not, you know, there's no one size fits all to win an election. Uh, but there are definitely lessons to be learned there. And, and I think you saw his brand of Hudson Valley, moderate, but also populist uh, politics uh, work well for Pat Ryan and John Mannion, as you mentioned. Um, for does does Laura Gillen fit that model too? I think she does, but I think Long Island is a different is a different beast than the Hudson Valley is. The Scoopus district in Orange County has trended very heavily to the Republican side, whereas when you go further north into uh, into the northern Hudson Valley and even the Syracuse area, uh, Democrats have actually been doing better and better there in the last couple of years. Long Island is a place where you know Trump has been surging and won Nassau County for the first time uh, in this in this presidential election. So it's impressive, even though I think some folks looked at that um, at that seat as one that Democrats should win. And I think there was a poll that came out a week or two before that had going up by yeah. double digits, which which the Democratic you know the Democrats on the ground quickly poo pooed and said that you know that's not gonna this is gonna be a close race, and they were right. But I think her I think her brand is a little different. She comes into it as a former town supervisor in the town of Hempstead, which is a huge municipality with a million people. So she's already represented a ton of people in that congressional district in the recent past. Uh, it's also a district where I think you're going to need to look at the data and the voting trends that come out in the next weeks and months to get a sense of what really happened there, because the Democratic base is very reliant on voters of color, particularly black voters in the village of Hempstead and other parts of the district, but also Latino voters. And then within Nassau County, the white voters in the district have the lowest rates of college education. And so that and, and that tends to signify support for Republicans. Right. So it's not really a swing district. It's more of a district where you, you know, each candidate walks in with a base and has to turn them out. Um, it will be interesting, given the trends we've seen, especially with Latino voters, how the, the precincts that are heavily Latino in the district went in this election, because I think part of the reason the race was closer than you might think it should be is what will, will be because there were Latino and perhaps black voters that were not voting Democratic. And that was Loren Amore, a senior vice president with Berlin Rosen. To hear his entire conversation, check out the Dispatches from Planet Albany podcast, which you can find at capitalpressroom.org or wherever you download your favorite shows. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by Beyond Plastics, which supports the Packaging Reduction and Recycling Infrastructure Act, working to cut plastic packaging in half. Plastics that cannot be recycled end up burned in incinerators, buried in landfills, or polluting rivers and the oceans. More information at beyondplastics.org.